Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with former congressman and dean of Liberty University's business school, Dave Bratt. He sheds light on what the U.S. midterms mean in terms of China and the economy going forward. Congressman Dave Bratt, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So obviously the midterms begin the headlines. I want to go starting forward like you know I think one of the big bipartisan issues is the economy and China. Both sides have different approaches on tackling those issues. So where do you see this going? Well my preference and I think the the left has been associated somewhat with globalism right so we need to dig in there and see and ask you know, our congressional colleagues or Senate colleagues, you know, where, where are you on these issues? Uh, but the globalist uh, thing is, is worrying, right? And so you kind of got the Euro group, 27, 28 Euro countries already combined on kind of a pro-socialist agenda. Uh, and then their goals, uh, and it, it, I think the American people are starting to sense this, but it's not clear yet, but the, the, they want to get rid of the nation state. Right, which goes back to Westphalia and 1650 and all this stuff. And they want to have a global empire. Well, empires don't go too good, right? Roman Empire, French, Napoleon, Hitler, empires, right? So you hear this and the average person doesn't think of any of this. And so in order for them to have a, a, an empire, uh, globalism has to get rid of the nation state. So then you start looking around the world and what's going on, uh, Russia, uh, the bear, the mother bear, is under attack. That's a major nation state. Uh, China is cracking up internally for a bunch of reasons. We'll probably get to that later. Uh, and uh, all that fire power is aimed at the U.S. Well, Dave, uh, this sounds fantastical, right? What are, you, are you making this up? Where's your evidence, right? Well, so uh, Marx, right? Marxism, neo-Marxism, communism. Uh, what, are, what are their characteristics? Where's the evidence for these claims? Well, uh, there can be no God. So from the left, there's a Marxist attack on God, right? Marx had, Marx had no, no God, no ethics, no uh, foundational philosophical system at all. Very simplified, you know, class struggle. That's it. Uh, which they multiplied now from capital and labor into many buckets to divide people. And then uh, no God, then uh, no ethics, no rule of law, etc. Defund the police. There's some evidence, and then also uh, no family. What do, you, what do you mean no family? What uh, drag queens in the schools here? Uh, one child policy in China? Is that good enough? Right? They've ruined their country. They got a demographic problem coming up. Peter Zehan is real good for the people watching. Uh, go check out. He's got a ton of YouTube stuff on that. The end of China as a as a nation state, the way we know of China uh, within a few years, within a decade for sure. And so uh, when it comes to China and economics, those things are just intricately woven together. Rand uh, reported in Bloomberg about a month ago, if China attacks Taiwan and just a one year war, there's a five to 10 percent GDP hit to the U.S. That's not a stock market hit. Right, a five to ten percent GDP hit. Our entire real economy hit by five to ten percent. The stock market's down fifty or more percent. Right, so just devastating. The hit to China is even more. Our economy is China's economy. Right, they don't have a consumer yet. Right, they don't have a. They haven't developed a consumer base of a middle class. Uh, so they they go to war against Taiwan. The implications that they lose thirty percent GDP. A third of their economy just goes bye-bye. And this is RAND, right? These are world-class, smart, PhD, smart, boring people. So this is not, you know, trying to hype stuff up. Uh, so that's just some glimmerings of what we're looking at with the economy moving forward linked to China. And it's a, it's a tight linkage. So given that, it seems like we're starting to see some of those trends here in America, that yep. globalist movement, the yep. socialism, the anti-God, anti-family. Yep. So given that, how do we defend against China if we're seeing the same things here? Well, the American people, that's up to the American people, right? It's a democracy, a democratic republic, whatever, however you want to call it. Uh, but uh, we've had leadership uh, since the founding, uh, which uh, came significantly out of the Enlightenment, which was based on human reason, 
uh, but it was human reason linked with the Judeo-Christian religious tradition, right? Cambridge was Christian, and John Harvard, who founded Harvard, was from Cambridge, a uh, pastor who founded Harvard. Harvard's motto in 1640 is truth for Christ and church. Uh, so there's your legacy. And uh, all of science, by the way, develops within uh, Judeo-Christian West, all of modern science. All the universities were founded by uh, Christian. I went to Princeton Seminary. Uh, Adam Smith, a uh, quasi-Presbyterian out of Scotland, uh, the father of modern, uh, free market economics. Uh, James Madison, uh, author of the Constitution, went to Princeton Seminary roughly back then. Uh, so there's your foundation in thought. And that system, right, it's a Judeo-Christian religious tradition linked with Greek reason. And those were the guardrails. <clears throat> and we've lived within that uh, for a couple hundred years. The West has lived within that, you know, for a thousand years, however you want to say it. Uh, so all the lessons, uh, we had the rule of law, we had political stability, we had geopolitical stability after World War, War, World War II for 50 years. And then we became richer than comprehension. So one would think you'd go, wow, that's cool. And instead of saying, wow, cool, they're saying, uh, the U.S. is getting cocky. We, we need to take them down a notch. They're the problem in the world, right? The U.S. is the problem. Uh, the country with the most political rights, civil rights, civil liberties that have done more for the rest of the world uh, than all the rest of the countries combined. Uh, how can you say that, Dave? Well, we had a couple arch enemies called uh, Germany and uh, Japan. Uh, now we're best buddies with them, right? Hitler, fascism, all this. We wrote constitutions. Uh, Germany was flourishing until they went globalist with this new energy policy stuff. So how do Americans do it? Uh, you just go back to the cookbook. What worked? China copied a lot of that cookbook, uh, right? And uh, a couple decades earlier, Deng uh, copied the cookbook, opened up some market reforms, and boom. And they, they followed part of the cookbook on the economic side, but not the political freedom side. And uh, Gorbachev uh, did some of it, but he, in, in the communist estimation, he did it backwards, right? So he, he opened up politically first uh, and not economically as much. And so we know the cookbook, uh, it's worked perfectly well. Uh, the leading indicator on all this is K-12 education, which is a disaster. And higher education, which now at Harvard or Yale or Princeton, rejects uh, Greek reason, right? Nietzsche was the first frontal assault on uh, Socrates, who's the father of, of reason in the West, uh, and the rest of it uh, is a footnote to Nietzsche and not to Socrates. And so we have some stiff headwinds coming at us, <clears throat> uh, but the, the, the good news is the left doesn't have a philosophical system or a theological system or an ethical system that they can name which seems like that would be easy competition. But for some reason, there's not enough folks uh, that, that admire the tradition with the confidence and courage, uh, which all the founders had to, to move forward. So anyone out there listening, it's time. And Congressman, on that note, especially with China opening up their markets and the yep. U.S. letting them into the World Trade Organization, it seemed that was on the grounds of making China more liberal, democratic, yep. right. potentially. Yep. But it seems the opposite happened. Right now, the free market countries are less free because of our reliance on China. Yeah. But do you see any change happening there, especially with all the zero COVID lockdowns? Yep. You see Apple kind of moving yep. to India. Where do you see this going? No, oh, I, I see huge change. China right now, the, the Evergrande real estate story, there's ghost cities, they're tearing down apartment buildings. Uh, on the investment front, it's easy when you start poor, right, the rate of growth, if you go from $1 to 2 it's 100% growth, right? So the growth rate's tremendous. Uh, but then after you build so many bullet trains and, and do so many apartment buildings uh, and infrastructure, then it gets harder. Where does your next dollar go? And that's where they're at right now. They are stuck. And uh, they have a 40% savings rate. So they can make a lot of errors uh, in where they put those dollars, but th it's not looking good right now. <clears throat> and so on the investment front, they got trouble. They have bubbles all over the place in the real estate sector, et cetera. They have debt 300% of GDP. In the US, we're 125% debt to GDP. England is similar. England had a sovereign debt crisis two weeks ago on their gilt, right, the 30-year gilt, which is their long-term treasury, 
bond that in the U.S. would be called the Treasury. That's the most conservative thing there is, right? So we have this coming at us. China has that coming at us. And I, I, the most problematic thing for China is globalism is already done. <clears throat> so theoretically, it's going to unravel. The U.S. cannot pull out abruptly or all, all the firms go bankrupt. But they're, they're coming back. The supply chains are coming back. That Peter Zian is good. Mexico is the next winner. <clears throat> Central America, South America, they start coming back. And it is stunning. And with COVID, right? The first lesson you learn, I'm the dean of a business school, right, Liberty University. <clears throat> the first thing you learn in Finance 101 is diversification. <laughs> That's the first lesson. So what do all the MBA, uh, Harvard MBA geniuses do? They put all their eggs in one basket, China, <clears throat> to grab an extra nickel in profits, right, just to grab that next dollar. And they've been extremely short-sighted. And so now, uh, when you get into uh, financial planning, et cetera, <clears throat> there's this thing called fiduciary responsibility. So I'm waiting to see this now, right? Xi Jinping put down the markers uh, last week with the 20th uh, Communist Party meetings and roughly did three things. He said, we're going straight on Marxist-Leninism. Two, we're getting rid of any market reforms. And uh, Li uh, Keqiong got demoted. He was the only guy that wanted a little bit of market reforms. And then three, they got rid of all the Chinese uh, peace and harmony lingo. And instead went to wear a war footing, uh, prepare for uh, struggle sessions, prepare for international tension, uh, et cetera. So now if you're a financial firm and you're still investing in China, you, it's your fiduciary responsibility to state that. And I asked a few lawyers last week, I said, what if they say, uh, we didn't know, we weren't aware of that, <laughs> right? Uh, no excuse. You can get sued like crazy. And there were some other colorful words they threw in. And so this is going to be very interesting now. <clears throat> Uh, China is on paper, no economic reforms, war footing, and we're investing there. BlackRock, hello, wake up, right, the trillion dollar man. Uh, this ESG stuff, Larry Fink was uh, challenged on that. Uh, you know, uh, ESGs, you know, this environmental uh, feel good stuff and social do gooder stuff and governance, gov good corporate governance. <clears throat> and uh, Fink moves half of his portfolio to China. And so one of these guys, young hotshot lawyer, uh, Justin, uh, I'm going to blank his last name, uh, but confront him at his own board meeting. He says, if, if, uh, how, how can you be putting half your money in China, their environment, you can't even see your hand in front of your face, uh, social do-gooders, it's a totalitarian surveillance state, and uh, corporate governance, uh, by the way, Americans don't know uh, to be on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, Chinese firms don't even have to pass an audit. You, every U.S. firm has to be audited to be on our own exchange. So we allow them on our exchange. They don't allow us to do anything. So globalism is coming to an end uh, soon, and that's going to have a massive impact on uh, China. We, about 20% of our economy is traded, 40, 50% of China is traded. So the impact on them is much more, they need us much more than we need them. And uh, we're win-win. U.S. is kind of a win-win country. We want to be friends, uh, but to be friends, you got to be our friend, right? You can't be an enemy and claim to be a friend. That was Dave Bratt, former congressman and dean of Liberty University's business school. And for those watching our full episode, after a break, we hear more from him on what the biggest challenge is in terms of China and what needs to be done. Our full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you soon.